Hello everyone and uh, welcome back to the new lesson of uh, engineering geology. Uh, today we are going to talk about sediment transport and deposition. Uh, you, if you recall in the last lesson we were talking about uh, soil formation and we talked about uh, some, uh, some soil uh, deposits which did not get transported away from the location from where they formed. Uh, and today we are going to talk about uh, soil deposits that uh, are uh, that are developed uh, away from the location where they form and the process in between the uh, in situ weathering and the deposition elsewhere uh, involved in this case is called transportation. We are going to look at the details of all the uh, different uh, uh, important uh, processes involved in this, but before we do that, we are going to look at the uh, question set of the previous lesson. Uh, the question set is here. The first question was which of the three most common clay minerals has the highest stability under ambient conditions? Uh, the discussion that we had on weathering, chemical weathering. Uh, that in that discussion I indicated that in comparison with rock minerals, clay minerals are much more stable under ambient conditions and as a result uh, they are more abundant near surface than some of the material, some of the minerals that occur way down in the, uh, in the Bowen reaction series in terms of uh, chemical uh, or, or weatherings, uh, the the the, uh, the minerals that are more susceptible to weathering, they do not occur that abundantly near the surface of the earth. Now, even then, the three most common clay minerals that we discussed in this particular uh, lesson, uh, in 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 the previous lesson, uh, namely, uh, kaolinite. Elite and smectite or montmorillonite they have got different uh, different levels of susceptibility to chemical weathering now uh, if you Consider this series here. Actually, we we looked at some of the chemical processes that involve that are involved in the uh, tertiary weathering of these uh, three most common clay minerals. And what we found is that under certain conditions, smectite mineral actually uh, uh, convert into elite or kaolinite. So from that discussion, it appeared that the weathering susceptibility of smectite is much higher in comparison with kaolinite and elite. In fact, kaolinite mineral is perhaps the most stable uh, under ambient condition and that is followed by elite and smectite is the least stable of all the three most abundant clay minerals. So this one here is least susceptible. to chemical weathering whereas smectite or montmorillonite uh, has got the highest susceptibility to uh, chemical weathering okay so so that actually uh, takes care of the first uh, question now the second question that i asked was which clay minerals form from chemical weathering of feldspar and we discussed these things in the course of last couple of presentations at length uh, uh, particularly for orthoclase or the potassium feldspar and what we indicated in the, during those dis discussions that under uh, acidic, uh, acidic conditions uh, in uh, presence of water uh, 
uh, autoclase mineral gets hydrolyzed into the and and that leads to the formation of kaolinite uh, clay mineral and that in turn the kaolinite clay mineral in turn can get leached and lead to the formation of uh, gibbsite or bauxite ore. Now the same a very similar chemical process is also there uh, that leads to the weathering of sodium feldspar. So the sodium feldspar also gets uh, converted into kaolinite mineral and uh, other, uh, other weathering products such as release of uh, alkali uh, ions and, uh, and uh, generation of uh, silicic acid. Okay, so that actually in a nutshell the chemical weathering process of uh, feldspar mineral. Then the third question that was asked was uh, to ask for, was to seek an explanation of the terms of a few terms. The first one of these terms was chelation and what is involved in chelation is that uh, metal ions they get trapped uh, and uh, they get trapped in the chemical structure of uh, organic compounds and, uh, and that process is called chelation. And this process has got uh, not only uh, not o has got importance not only in chemical weathering but it is also commercially exploited in removal of several metal ions from different environments. Then the second uh, term that I asked you to explain was illuviation and to do this to the to explain this really we have to look at a stratified deposit. Uh, let us say uh, let us let us consider the uh, residual soil deposit that we uh, talked about in the previous uh, lesson and what you had in that particular uh, stratified deposit is an O horizon near surface. So this one here is the surface and then you have got O horizon that is full of chemical uh, that is full of uh, uh, organic uh, chemicals uh, partly decomposed such as partly decomposed uh, leaves or uh, animal remains and so on and so forth and underneath the O horizon typically uh, we had A horizon and A horizon was uh, I, I stated that it is rich in minerals in organic minerals but it has got some organic uh, compounds in it underneath the A horizon there is a B horizon and underneath C horizon underneath B horizon there is C horizon which, which includes uh, partly decomposed bedrock or unweathered rock. So what happens and actually this kind of as I indicated in the previous lesson this kind of stratification this kind of stratified deposit develops after uh, chemical weathering chemical and physical weathering of the bedrock in situ without any transportation process over a very long time. Uh, if there is uh, uh, less time available for weathering then these kind of distinct horizons are not uh, not uh, they do not develop but anyway uh, we are considering in this case is a mature uh, stratified uh, deposit of residual soil uh, like the one that is uh, shown here. So here what happens actually uh, in, in environments that are exposed to very high precipitation levels of precipitation such as rainfall uh, and snowfall and so on and so forth in those environments chemicals from O horizon and A horizon they get leached out they get leached out and the products of leaching uh, 
uh, accumulate in uh, accumulation products of uh, products of leaching uh, accumulate underneath at within deeper layers. So, accumulation of products chemical products of leaching uh, from shallower layers and that is typical of the B horizon. Uh, and this kind of process actually gives rise to alluviating horizon and alleviating horizon. So, these two are essentially alleviating, they are essentially losing uh, minerals and this one here is an alleviating horizon, which actually accumulates uh, products of uh, chemical weathering from shallower layers. So, that explains the terms uh, uh, alluviation as well as alluviation, although uh, the question did not ask for the explanation of alluviation. Now, the third question that I asked was spheroidal weathering, what is meant by spheroidal weathering, third part of the third question. Now, uh, what I explained in the previous uh, presentation is that physical weathering involves breaking of larger piece of rocks into smaller pieces such as these and then what happens actually near the corners such as these the amount of area that is available that is exposed to the weathering agents that is much larger in comparison with the volume that it represents. As a result, weathering is much more uh, fast paced near these corners in comparison with flatter areas such as these. So, here uh, you will have slow weathering typically whereas, near the corners you are going to have fast weathering and this process actually leads to gradual rounding off of the corners of these small of these pieces of rock and finally, what you end up with finally, what you end up with is a situation like this, where you have basically left out, you are basically left out with a bunch of rounded pieces of rocks and this particular type of weathering is called spheroidal weathering. Okay, so, that actually takes care of the question set that was uh, given to you in the previous uh, presentation. Now, we hop on to the subject matter of this particular topic. So, what we want to learn in this at the uh, in this uh, lesson are the factors affecting sediment transport. We are going to we are going to be able to list the major erosional and depo depositional features that arise because of flowing water, wind and ice and we would be able to see the grain size characteristics of the deposits that form uh, during these processes of transportation. So, first of all the question that comes to mind is what is meant by transportation. Now, the products of weathering, products of physical and chemical weathering, they actually get transported away from the location where they were originally formed. Now, this and, and they get deposited at distances uh, at, at great distances uh, 
uh, from the location where they originated and this particular process is called transportation. Now, transportation can uh, be uh, transportation can be triggered transportation of sediments can be triggered by several different agents and what we are the main ones are uh, flowing water water flow and water flow could be because of uh, flowing river or it could be because of ocean waves or submarine currents or it could be because of uh, melt water uh, streams originating from glaciers or it could be because of wind or it could be because of ice itself. So, these are the main agents that actually trigger the transportation process and we are going to consider each one of them in some detail in this particular uh, lesson. Now, in order to understand the transportation process, we need to understand the uh, action of fluids which actually triggers the sediment transport. Now, the physical processes that actually are involved uh, in, in uh, fluid action in this particular case include development of lift and drag. So, what is meant by these two terms is explained uh, very crudely uh, with a with these sketches actually consider that you have got near the surface of the earth you have got some uh, pieces of rock or clasts and then uh, water or wind is flowing around these pieces and the streamlines that develops in this process are of this type and what is going to happen in this case typically is that the streamlines are going to be squeezed close together immediately on near the top of the clast that it is actually passing by. So, this one is our clast in question and because of that what is going to happen there there is there, there a pressure drop is going to develop near the top of this particular clast and consequently the clast is going to feel an upward force and this type of force is called lift. So, this is actually exactly the same kind of process which uh, gives rise to the lift above airfoils or the wings of an aircraft. It is exactly the same kind of process and also there is a pressure drop near the front of this particular of this type of uh, configuration of this kind of flow regime and as a result the clast also feels a force in the forward direction and that type of force is called drag. So, the clast gets dragged in the direction of flow. So, in this case the direction of flow is oriented like this. So, this is our flow direction. So, the clast is going to feel a drag along the direction of the flow and also it is going to feel a lift uh, above uh, perpendicular lift in the vertical direction because of uh, the close packing of the streamlines uh, near the top of the clast. In addition to that the clast is also going to have its own weight. So, weight of the clast is going to be counteracted by lift and if lift becomes larger than the weight the particle is going to become entrapped or entrained within the uh, within the fluid flow. So, these are the forces that you need to content and here the factors that affect these forces that include the kinematic viscosity and density of fluid. It also includes the weight of the particle in other words specific gravity of the particle and what is of interest here 
are a couple of dimensionless parameters shown near the bottom of this slide. Uh, the first one, the one on the left is called the shields parameter in which you have got a quantity called tau naught at in the, in the uh, numerator and this particular quantity depends on the characteristics of how uh, characteristics of packing. In other words, how closely packed are individually grain individual grains uh, near the near the location where the transportation process is being triggered. It also depends the qu the quantity tau naught. It also depends on the geometry of individual grains such as particle size diameter. Uh, in the denominator what you see is a thing called gamma and gamma is really is the uni, uh, is really the unit weight of the particles that are being transported that are uh, that the fluid action is trying to transport subscripted s subscripted g g subscript s is the specific gravity so this one gamma is the unit weight this one is the specific gravity of the solids solid particles and again uh, d we have got particle size diameter appearing here again particle diameter is in the denominator as well. Uh, you remember particle size was there uh, in uh, the in the quantity tau naught which is there in the numerator as well. So, so this particular combination this particular combination is called Shields parameter because it was originally uh, introduced uh, by a person called Shield in 1935. Uh, and on the right here is another combination which is really a surrogate of uh, Reynolds number which says which actually indicates whether a flow regime is going to be turbulent or it is going to be uh, laminar. And this involves again tau naught in the denominator in the numerator and it also has got another quantity called rho subscript f and this is the unit mass or mass density of fluid. Then you have got particle size diameter also in the numerator and in the denominator what you have got is a quantity called nu uh, Greek symbol nu and this is the kinematic viscosity of fluid. Okay, so, that is that basically explains the symbols and what shield did he plotted shields parameter against the Reynolds number and what he published was a chart which is shown here. So, what you see here is a zone near the bottom of the chart which is shaded and that particular zone indicates uh, situations in which no sediment transport is going to take place. So, if you are above this zone on this particular plot then sediment transport is going to be triggered. So, what we are looking at in this chart is a zone is a zone bounded by a curved line like this and if you are underneath this particular line then there are going to be no sediment transport and if you are above this particular line then there will be sediment transport. 
and depending on where you are above the uh, line, different types of bed forms can be observed and some of which are super uh, some of which are indicated on this chart itself like ripples or bars or undulations and if the flow regime is increase i mean the flow velocity increases even further then suspension and saltation is going to take place as is indicated by the top middle portion of this plot Okay, so this is this chart was published by Shield in 1935. At very uh, actually nearly at the same time, another person by the name Hulstrom he conducted a series of A systematic investigation regarding sediment transport and he published a bunch of charts that are known uh, as Hulstrom charts and these charts are shown on this slide here. So, these are empirical charts uh, published by Hulstrom in 1936 and what is here essentially is a plot it, uh, this, this, is a, this is a plot of particle size on the horizontal scale, particle size is plotted in uh, logarithmic scale and what you see on the left chart is flow velocity uh, in the vertical scale that is also in logarithmic uh, scale and the one on the left that involves sediment transport by the action of water flow. And the one on the on the right here represents the situations that arise when uh, sediment transport is triggered by wind action. So on the left, the chart that is that represents the situations uh, that arise because of uh, flowing water uh, concerning sediment transport. In this case you can see three zones. If the flow velocity is quite large in uh, uh, and you are near the top of this particular plot, then erosion is going to take place and that is quite intuitive. In between erosion and entrainment, uh, in between erosion and deposition, there is a zone w in which sediments are going to be entrained within the flowing mass of water and if the flow velocity becomes even smaller then particles are going to deposit going to get deposited near the bottom of the uh, of the flow and what you end up with in is in zone uh, of deposition so if you have got the largest flow velocities then you are going to trigger erosion in between uh, in between intermediate uh, flow velocities, you are going to get entrainment of uh, particles dislodged within the flowing mass and if the flow velocity becomes very, very small, then deposition of uh, entrained sediments is going to take place as is indicated by the three zones on the chart on your left. Now let us consider the chart on the right. In this case, you have got two zones essentially. If you have got larger flow velocity, again you are going to have erosion and as the flow velocity becomes smaller, then you are going to have deposition. Now here, there is a, you, should, you should notice that the vertical scale in this case is not in logarithmic scale, but it is actually in uh, arithmetic scale, but the flow velocities in this case, uh, flow velocities in this case are comparatively larger. It, 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 uh, you can see if you compare the particle sizes on the chart uh, that represents uh, erosion and deposition because of flowing water and the chart that rep 
represents uh, wind action. Uh, if you compare those two charts, then you will see that uh, erosion and transport transportation by wind requires relatively larger velocities uh, compared to those required uh, in case of water flow. And that is quite intuitive because of the differences in the densities and kinematic viscosities that are there between wind and water. In fact, the density of wind is approximately uh, one, one, one thousandth of the density of water and the kinematic viscosity of, of uh, wind under ambient condition of say 20 degrees Celsius uh, at the sea level it is approximately, approximately uh, one tenth of the viscosity of water and these, these things reflect in the capacity in the smaller capacity of wind in sediment transportation. Okay. So, first of all we consider uh, water action, action uh, the sediment transport triggered by water flow and one of the agents one of the physical processes involved uh, in this case is river flow erosion in erosion act, erosional activity because of river flow is triggered as indicated in the preceding by hydraulic action and this is essentially lift and drag once again. It could also be due to abrasion the particles that are entrained in the water flow they can abrade uh, they can actually rub against the uh, rub against the uh, bed bed forms and that actually is going to dislodge even more uh, even more number of particles and then the third one that is involved here is cavitation and the cavitation process essentially uh, arises when the water flow becomes very turbulent and and uh, because of because of the turbulence the uh, flow i mean because of the turbulence uh, bubbles form within the flowing mass and these bubbles sometimes implode and the implosion of the bubble actually uh, leads to the development of jets of air and these jets impinge onto the rock surface and they are sometimes powerful enough in case of very high velocity environments and they can also trigger more erosion and this type of activity is seen near the bottom of a of a high waterfall and the fourth one fourth one uh, fourth of the causes of erosion by because of uh, river is corrosion and this is essentially chemical weathering so if there is chemical if there are some chemicals uh, in solution within the solution and these uh, these chemicals sometimes corrode and they lead to the chemical weathering of underlying bedrock and that actually accentuates the, uh, the uh, dislodgement of particles from near the surface of the bedrock. Now sediment load that is carried by river they could be suspended load, they could be bed load or they could be dissolved load and suspended load are those particles that are entrained within the flowing water itself. Then it could be bed load the particles that are being dragged along the bed forms along the along the uh, river bed or it could be dissolved load the chemicals that are being carried by water flow in solution. Now dissolved load by far is the largest proportion of all these three and it constitutes typically about 70 percent of the uh, of the mineral load that is carried by river flow. Okay, now we look at the erosional activity of wind. Now wind uh, takes, uh, takes uh, solid particles entrained solid particles by three processes essentially. The first one is deflation. Uh, this is because of uh, localized drop of pressure 
and uh, and uh, because of that it is a portion of the surface is simply blown away by the wind that is blowing over. Then the second one that we are going to consider is abrasion it is essentially the same as the rubbing action that we uh, talked about when we when we looked at uh, erosional activity of water near the bed near the river bed. Then the third one in this case is attrition. So, what happens here is uh, that the particles that are in that are entrained in wind uh, that are entrained in wind of high velocity that goes and impinge against exposed rock surfaces and that leads to dislodgement of uh, clusts of rock from the surface wear and tear of the surface and this process is called attrition. Uh, now, the second the, se uh, the, the second aspect here is really the sediment load. So, here again as it is quite similar conceptually as that involving river flow, uh, there will be a bunch of particles that are going to slide roll or creep near the bottom near the interface of the bedrock and the wind that is flowing over the bedrock or it could be taken into suspension uh, within the within the volume of wind within the volume of the flowing wind or there could be saltation which is somewhat intermediate between the particles that are carried as bed load and those are in permanent suspension. So, these these particles really uh, taken into suspension temporarily and then the flow velocity is not enough or the wind velocity is not enough to sustain their uh, uh, sustain them within suspension and as a result they get deposited a little bit uh, within a little bit of distance down uh, downwind and this process is called saltation. Now, the transport mechanisms because of ocean uh, currents essentially very similar to the transport mechanisms that we considered uh, concerning river flow, but in this case there is an essential difference that the flow velocities typically are much smaller in comparison uh, with uh, sub aerial water flow uh, uh, like river flow. Uh, under what under under ocean uh, uh, currents are typically much smaller velocities, uh, but the physical details of the processes are very similar. So here again, you have got lift and drag, abrasion, and corrosion. But here you see a new term called turbidity current, and this particular uh, this particular transport mechanism arises when there is a submarine mass wasting process such as submarine landslide that is occurring near the continental shelf margin. In those situations very large uh, very large volume of soil uh, can be taken into suspension because of large what large velocities involved in the process and that leads to the transportation of much larger particle because uh, of the large velocities of movement. In other in other cases in other cases because of the uh, smaller flow velocities in case of marine sediments in case of marine transportations transportation processes the sediment size that is typically transported in the marine environment are much smaller the size of the size of the sediments are much smaller in comparison with those transported by the action of uh, river flow. Sediment load here is once again uh, that include suspended load and dissolved load. Transportation erosion and sedimentation process associated with uh, moving ice, ice movement. 
or glaciers. Uh, first, we consider the physical processes involved in erosion, uh, glacier related erosion. The process that is involved uh, include plucking and what happens in this case is uh, pieces of rock that get entrapped in the ice flow, ice that is flowing on top of the bedrock and there could be abrasion as well and abrasion like earlier it is essentially rubbing of, uh, of ice and the load that the ice is carrying near the interface of bedrock and this process is called abrasion and as a result actually this, this particular process leads to the grooving and polishing of exposed bedrock surfaces, uh, bedrock surfaces exposed to uh, glacier movement and we are going to see the landforms uh, that arise because of that. Now the sediment loads that are carried by glacier are of three types. Uh, the, the sediment load that is carried within ice that are of three types, supraglacial, n-glacial or subglacial. Supraglacial sediments involve those sediments that are carried on top of the uh, moving ice. N-glacial debris include those clasts that are entrapped within the flow of ice by the uh, flow lines, streamlines or it could be subglacial, subglacial sediments are carried, they, they are essentially conceptually very similar to the bed loads that are carried by river flow and wind uh, which we already have discussed. Now sediment load because of glacier movement can also be glaciofluvial sediments and these are those sediments that are worked by water, melt water that originate from melting of the glacier. So they are reworked by water, so they have got very similar, they have got many characteristics similar to those observed uh, in sediments deposited by water flow. Or sediments could be glacial lacustrine, the sediments that are dropped underneath glacial lakes, uh, they also have got similarity with, uh, with uh, sediments that develop underneath non-glacial lakes uh, and uh, underneath the low velocity regimes of uh, lakes that are not related to glaciation. Okay, now we look at, we try in order to recapitulate the processes involved in transportation, we look at a couple of a uh, couple of uh, sketches. The one on the bottom left actually shows the transportation processes involved uh, with the flow of water and as I indicated uh, before the sediment loads could be either suspended load, uh, suspended load or bed load or the sediments that are being transported because of saltation. The one on top right, the cartoon on top right of this particular slide shows this, uh, the, uh, the transportation or the uh, transportation processes that are involved because of wind and in this case you again have got suspended load, then bed loads that are transported from one location to the other because by sliding, rolling or creep or you have got saltation as well just like what you had in case of uh, flowing water. But here you see you try to you try to notice an essential difference in this case that involve the secondary uh, movement of, of particles triggered by bouncing of uh, of when 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 particles when particles that are airborne that are taken into that are taken into suspension temporarily because of saltation uh, 
within the uh, within the wind within the within the volume of wind uh, when that when those particles land at some distance downwind they actually can collide with particles that are not initially mobile and these particles can be airborne because of the uh, second because of the collision process and this kind of secondary uh, movement is not normally observed in case of transportation processes involved in uh, water flow because in case of flowing water the the uh, impact of the of the landing particles are cushioned because of the buoyancy effects as a result of the presence of water Uh, now, we try to look at a number of features that arise because of fluvial erosion. Some of these features have already been discussed when we were looking at landforms in one of the earlier lessons. Now, the first, uh, first type of landform that is important here are gorges and canyons and this type of landform arises because of, uh, of sudden increase in the flow velocity or, uh, or sudden uplift of the river bed because of some tectonic activity or other uh, reasons, other geologic processes and this can lead to the undercutting of the valley bottom and as a result uh, gorges and canyons develop. Then there are other types of landforms which we have already discussed. Uh, involving escarpments and waterfalls and in this case uh, actually river undercuts soft rock stratum uh, preferentially in comparison with with the uh, with the strata that are more resistant to erosional activities and as a result steep bluffs actually form uh, and if such kind of bluff forms along the river flow then uh, there is uh, that 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 leads to the development of a waterfall and we discussed these issues uh, in the previous lesson in greater detail uh, one of the previous lessons in greater detail now another type of feature that is associated with fluvial erosion is lag sediment uh, these are essentially coarse grain sediments that cannot be transported by the by the flowing water and they are left behind really uh, and these uh, these this process leads to the development of coarse grained uh, deposits called lag deposits they could sometimes even include sands uh, in the finer side typically they include gravel size particles or coarser grained particles or particles that are even coarser grained. Uh, then we look at the, some of the features, important features related to wind erosion. Uh, we have discussed at least uh, one of them uh, a few minutes back called surface blowout and this is essentially a large, a, a reasonably large area a few meter across uh, maybe. Uh, uh, these areas are simply sucked out of from the surface because of the low pressure that locally sometimes develop during wind uh, during uh, wind blowing uh, during uh, blowing of uh, wind and that process leads to the development of surface blowout the second important feature uh, is uh, desert pavement it is essentially uh, it is very similar to the to the feature that we discussed just uh, a few minutes back uh, regarding lag sediment and these are these include the soil particles that are that cannot be transported by wind action uh, from from within these soil particles finer grain particles are the, are blown away by wind leaving the coarser grain uh, gravel size or sand size particles and they, these, these lead to the development of a feature called desert pavement. Then uh, features that relate to abrasion or rubbing action include yardang, they are basically uh, 
uh, narrow uh, ridges that narrow and long ridges that uh, of bedrock that actually align in the direction of wind movement. Then there could be pedestal rock, there are columnar rock which is eroded away near the base and sometimes uh, the, the top portion of these rocks they have got a larger footprint than the areas near the bottom portion of the columnar form. Uh, and the third one that is uh, that uh, arises third important one that we uh, are discussing here because uh, that arises because of abrasion activity of wind is ventifact and is uh, this this particular type of landform is essentially a polished surface that arises when uh, wind carrying lot of uh, debris uh, such as uh, sand size particles they keep on impinging on exposed rock surface le leading to uh, development of a polish on that surface. So, that is called ventifact. Now, features be, uh, that relate to wave action. So, here uh, what we have uh, typically is our sea cliffs they are steep bluffs that face the uh, face the ocean, then there could be headlands or bays. They uh, basically involve erosion, uh, eroding away of soft rocks, uh, leaving behind some of the projections uh, of harder layers and they are called headlands or there could be wave terraces. These, these are essentially shallow flat shelves cut by waves. Uh, then some of the features related to glacial erosion, striations, uh, scratching and grooving of rock which we have already discussed. Then there could be crag and trail. These are essentially hard rocks that protrude uh, th that, that, that protect soft rock and rocher montane. Uh, these are basically asymmetric hills, asymmetric humps of bedrock with one side uh, steeper the, the uh, down, down, glacier, down glacier slope much steeper uh, compared to the up glacial slope and the down glacial slope is, uh, is quite rough because of the plucking activity of the, uh, of the ice movement whereas the up glacial slope, up glacial gentle slope is quite smooth because of the polish grinding. Uh, affected by ice flow. And some of the wind blown are Eolian deposits, uh, dunes that we already know, dunes could be of different uh, geometry, different types of footprints and they can be crescentic or they can be straight. Then there is loess deposits, these are essentially silt and clay grade particles uh, that are dumped by wind. Uh, some of the fluvial deposits, alluvial fans and cones, these are when mountain streams enter a flat area and there is a sudden change in velocity involved and that leads to the dumping of coarse as well as fine grain deposits. Floodplain deposits, these are essentially, uh, these are essentially overbank deposits, uh, low velocity regime deposits. So, they are rich in fine grained sediments sorted because uh, the sediments that are near that are deposited near the river bank are much larger in size whereas, those deposited further away they are typically of finer grains. Then channel deposits, these are deposits uh, that form within the channel. They are again sorted, but they are uh, relatively coarser grain in comparison with floodplain deposits because of the larger velocity regime uh, in which they get deposited. Then there are deltas, they are again deposits near river mouths, uh, low velocity regime. So, they are the sediments are typically rich in finer grain, finer grain sizes. And then there are natural levees and point bars, they are narrow ridges of sand along the river bank and typically inside of a curve 
and they contain a lot of coarser grain deposits because of higher velocity of the flow involved. Marine deposits could, could be shallow water deposits such as beaches, spits and bars and tombola uh, as explained in the list there or they could be deep water deposits. Uh, they could include uh, turbidites and turbidites are the deposits laid by, uh, laid by turbidity currents because of the high energy involved in this case they could be of mixed grain size and there could be pelagic mud these are deposited in very low energy environment so they are very fine grained uh, they, they include very fine grained particles. Uh, glacial deposits they could be deposited directly from the ice in this case the grain size could be quite rich I mean they could vary over a very wide margin and they could be uh, they are typically unsorted uh, because of the capability of ice to carry a lot of different sizes of grains they are not reworked by water examples include moraine and drumlin or they could be stratified which are reworked with water and in this case uh, there is a lot of similarity uh, in, in, this, in these deposits compared to deposits laid by river flow and examples of these uh, stratified drifts are Kame, Kame deposits, eskers and outwash deposits. Uh, outwash deposits are uh, they sometimes uh, generate because of very large flow of very large volume of water suddenly released because of melting of a large volume of glacier and in such cases the flow velocities could be quite high and much larger uh, particles can be deposited in the process whereas whereas Kame and eskers typically are composed of sand and gravel size particles whereas outwash could be quite rich in times uh, in gravel size particles. To summarize this lesson uh, we looked at an outline of the agents of sediments sediment transport processes uh, list of all the factors that affect these processes and some major erosional and depositional landforms including the compositional characteristics of the sediments that are deposited in these processes. Finally we wrap up this particular lesson with a question set uh, which is as follows what are the main differences in sediment transport by flowing water and wind why ice laid deposits are usually poorly sorted while fluvial deposits and eolian deposits are usually well sorted then the third question is name two poorly sorted deposits laid in marine and fluid uh, fluvial environments and the fourth one uh, explain the following terms Point Bar, Kame and Yardam. Uh, try, to, uh, try to answer these questions uh, when we meet in the next with the next lesson we are I am going to talk about the answers to these questions. So until we meet uh, in the next lesson bye for now thank you very much.